Dear friends, welcome to the Australia Today. And uh, there is no surprise that today's uh, special show is going to unravel a lot of mysteries. The particular mystery we are looking at is uh, India's deadly diplomats in the global Khalistan's bonkers propaganda. And to unravel this mystery, we have none other than uh, the eminent Canadian journalist, Terry Milwiski. Terry, uh, welcome to the Australia Today once again. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And because this is a this is such a great mystery that I've invited uh, my colleagues Jitaj Jabaradwaj and Pallavi Jain in the studio because I don't want them to be, uh, you know, felt um, left out when we unravel how can India's diplomats become so deadly that the Khalistan is creating a bonkers propaganda. So, Terry, uh, first question to you is, did India's High Commissioner in Australia travel to Canada to join a so-called death squad to kill Mr. Hadeep Nijjar. Now, this is a, this is a, one of the important things to realize about this whole caper by Sikhs for Justice and its hangers-on, is the utter and complete lack of seriousness. None of them believe any of this nonsense. It's meant to be nonsense. It's meant to be outrageous. It's meant to get uh, them in the news and raising money as a result of being in the news. Uh, the uh, preposterous notion of this uh, uh, mobile diplomatic flying death squad, uh, I mean, you do have to think about it, though. What this, it has a, a serious origin. Mm -hmm. That origin is the notion which is very important to Sikhs for Justice at the moment and to the whole movement, that India must be vilified as a, and I quote, ge genocidal and fascist state. Uh, because uh, if you con consider India any less than that, um, you're not a supporter of the Sikhs upping and leaving that state. Or, or, uh, and so they need to demonize India. And it's, this is, we're talking about an organization in Sikhs for Justice. It's kind of like an old-time religion. You've got to believe. You've got to follow the talking points. You know, we lay down what you these are the talking points and everyone's got to sing from that song sheet. So you'll find very few people in demonstrations all around the world that we've had in the last couple of days uh, who will deviate from that line uh, that uh, uh, India, to quote Gopatwan Singh Panoon, who when he came, I believe he was in Australia or talking about Australia when he said this, he believes uh, or says he believes that um, Sikhs in uh, India are suffering, and I quote, an ongoing genocide since the time of Indira Gandhi uh, and right up to the present day under Narendra Modi. Uh, and of course, if you, if you are at all awake, uh, you will know that this uh, genocide, this alleged genocide that's going on all the time uh, in uh, India has not apparently been noticed by the Sikhs who live in India. Now, this is this is uh, this is a very important topic. This is this is central to what we're talking about here, because th those who are not singing from that song sheet, those who live in mainly in Punjab, of what uh, 25 or so million Sikhs in the world, uh, all but a couple of million who are in the diaspora live in India, and most of those in Punjab. So the vast majority of the people who would be affected by any separation of Punjab to form an independent state called Khalistan, uh, would be residents of Punjab. And uh, the reason that's so important, of course, is because this referendum is currently extended uh, outside India only to residents of the diaspora, uh, six who are over the age of 18 years old. Um, now, you can already see where I'm going, right? The, 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 there's some large problems looming, uh, not the least of which is that if uh, the uh, Sikhs living inside Punjab, indeed, all the residents of Punjab, including the 42% who are not Sikh and the 58% who are in Punjab, if they don't get a vote, and they won't if the Indian government has its way because they banned the vote, as you well know. It's an illegal operation inside India. 
then the whole enterprise is a complete waste of time. It, it has no relevance. It has no credibility. I mean, so what if 2 million out of 23 voted this way or that? doesn't matter. I mean, it, it means nothing. It's pointless. It's irrelevant. Mm. But if they do get a vote because uh, Mr. Paloon succeeds in his endeavor, and he gets lots of seats in the diaspora, so many, in fact, that he goes off to the UN with the wind in his sails. This is the idea. This is the plan. He goes off to the UN with credibility at his back. And he says, look, I've had this overwhelming vote of support uh, in the diaspora. I need the UN to get behind me to persuade the Indian government to allow uh, a, a peaceful and democratic vote. And as I say, the problem that, that arises then is uh, that if then, and uh, this is, I grant you, a long way down the road, but just think it through with me. If then the residents of Punjab do get to vote, what then? Well, I'll tell you what then. Mm. The vote fails massively, massively, because only a minute fraction of the population of Punjab and, and of the Sikhs of Punjab supports an independent state. The, the, the perhaps uh, I mean people often quote the election figures fine with me although the election the, the independence was not to my knowledge an issue in either the last election or the one before that in 2017 in Punjab nevertheless it's not irrelevant that when offered uh, democratic uh, separatist candidates uh, in the last election uh, they got what two and a half percent of the vote mm -hmm. in, a, in a in a state that's 58% seat, 2.5%, and no mm -hmm. seats, except there was a federal seat, of course, for Simranjit Singh Man. Um, and in the election before that, I believe it was 0.3% of the vote. So they did, uh, they did not do quite as well as NOTA, none of the above. Uh, so uh, either they get a referendum fails massively, mm. or they don't get a vote and the rest of the referendum is irrelevant. So they're running into a brick wall. So they need to, they need to sh shake things up. Uh, Panin, Panun seems, uh, needs somehow to keep things going. And mm. I apologize for the long answer, but this is where we get, this is how we got to where we are. Mm. Is that, you know, he, he, he understands all this better than me or you. He knows the sort of crash that he's heading for. So he's trying to keep things going somehow, keep it afloat by paddling fast. Stay afloat by running as fast as you can. And uh, so they decided, well, here's a good way of uh, getting attention. It succeeded uh, by effectively painting targets on the backs of Indian diplomats. And, 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 and let's be clear about this, uh, since you asked about this, they are saying, that all of these diplomats from Birmingham, England, and they're posted in San Francisco and Washington and Rome, don't forget Rome, and Ottawa and Vancouver, all over the world, that all of them mm. are guilty of killing, murdering uh, by Shaheed uh, Jatedar Hardy Nijar in Surrey, British Columbia, which is. Uh, I looked it up, 13,000 kilometers from Melbourne. So your, your esteemed high commissioner here in, in, in Australia would have had to um, fly, what is it? I don't know, 40 hours or something like that in the, over the weekend in order to get to the parking lot at Mr. Nijar's Gurdwara in Surrey in order to uh, kill him in concert with all the other killers uh, who had arrived from around the world all of them, I suppose, pretty exhausted. Um, and so the, I, I call them the deadly diplomats. Um, and, but it's, it's not a laughing matter when you can successfully uh, gin up a wave of anxiety and fear among mm -hmm. the diplomatic corps. I mean, would you bet that there's no nutcase in the crowd at the demonstration? Would you, would you bet that there's nobody there who is so swept away by their emotions, which, mm. as you've seen, are pretty high? The manhandling Jay here. Mm. Uh, there, there, was, there were manhandling people in other locations around the world during these demonstrations. Mm. You want to bet that not one of them is crazy enough to pull a knife or a gun? 
I would, I'd like to keep my family out of the line of fire if I was an Indian diplomat. So they've imposed uh, in Canada's paying extra security for, for our, uh, the diplomats in Canada. Uh, and uh, that may endure. I think, uh, Terry, we have lost you, um, lost the connection. Uh, Jitath, uh, Terry mentioned about you being manhandled, and that's like recorded live on camera when we were doing the live show from St. Kilda Road. Uh, Ter Terry is back, I think. Uh, Terry, uh, Jitath has a question for you uh, regarding the, the manhandling of journalists, the, the violent extremist acts that they do. And um, Jay, go on. Jay, your mic is off, I think. I'm sorry. Terry, what you said is rightly so. There can be one lone wolf which can um, come up and harm you. Um, I'm not sure um, how severely, but uh, they ha there is potential. I mean, young kids as old as 10, 12 were there in the rally, which I attended uh, two days back, and they were having different sick arms in their hands, which are um, generally uh, allowed in, in uh, view of uh, religious ornaments. I mean, in a political rally, if you have those religious ornaments, which can potentially harm me, uh, they can break my head, they can break my knee or something like this. It takes those 10 seconds when uh, that lone wolf is th not thinking rationally and have done something. So in my view, it's a serious, serious issue and uh, uh, probably Australian government or uh, I'm not sure about where Canadian government stand on this. Uh, they look really far, far away from the reality. But what do we do? I mean, I can't, uh, what are the options for diplomats and what are the options for reporters like us who go there in the field to report these Khalistan rallies or protests or on uh, other issues? Um, litigation is one of the way which you have uh, faced in you know, when you reported the Khalistan issues and physical harm is now looks like a very real uh, consequence of our reporting. I think it's just a matter of time before somebody gets hurt. Uh, and uh, let, let's hope it isn't badly hurt. Let's hope it's just, you know, a scuffle. Somebody bangs up their knee when they're taken to the ground, that kind of thing. Uh, it, it was which are common in, in demonstrations, which uh, typically are sort of performative. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, somebody says, well, I'm prepared to get arrested by the police and the police drag them off theatrically. All the cameramen get a shot. And that's pretty much the end of the end of the day. They say to the guy, OK, well, you can go. You know, we don't really want to expend a lot of court time on trivia. So mm -hmm. off you go. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Um, what can we do? Well, number one, of course, uh, this will not be news to you. Be prepared. Make sure your battery is full mm -hmm. and make sure you're rolling, preferably with a spare phone. Everyone's got a spare phone in their drawer. The last phone, you know, oh, you had to have the upgrade so you could get, you know, digital flashing lights on your new phone uh, that were better than the old phone. Well, keep that old phone. Mm. Uh, and, and and whip it out when the, when the other one gets gets smashed. Don't go to a demonstration with, with fewer than two. You'll be glad you did. Uh, you can use two at once if you like and get two angles on the interview. Um, and record. Uh, you know, if you see any rough stuff, uh, don't don't button off. Don't take a shot, reposition, and take another shot because in that gap, the defense lawyer can say all kinds of things that might have happened. Oh, well, isn't it a coincidence that you just didn't have to be rolling uh, when uh, your client hit my client? And here comes my client to swear on a stack of Bibles that that's what happened. And you've got no evidence that it's wrong. Uh, we had a very uh, important case in Vancouver, which precipitated a full dress judicial inquiry uh, and uh, hearings, changes in the law. And it was all about a distressed, lost, confused, tired, hungry Polish traveler who arrived 
in Canada from Poland for the first time ever, didn't speak the language. Well, his, his mother wasn't there to pick him up where he thought she would be. Anyway, he lost it. And uh, he, he didn't attack anyone, but the police attacked him mm. and tasered him and killed him. And uh, that, his mother would never got, have received any compensation. And the truth of the matter would never have emerged, were it not for a fellow named Pritchard, who kept rolling on the whole thing. He got his phone out as soon as he saw there was trouble, and he kept rolling all the way, no matter even if there were spots where not much going on, and you think, well, why is he still... He did the right thing. He kept rolling. So there was never a point where a lawyer for the, uh, for the police could say, here's something happened in there, and you know, you're not telling the whole story. So tell mm -hmm. the whole story. Uh, and, and, and that really made a huge difference. It sounds like a small point. Believe me, it's not. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, of course, uh, you may perhaps end up in court. Typically, uh, um, what happens is uh, online uh, and on your phone, you'll get threats mm -hmm. uh, to which you should act, react with caution, of course, but uh, uh, not panic because they wouldn't be phoning you to tell you uh, if they really were going to come and uh, harm you. They just want you to be scared. Mm -hmm. So it's useful to know that. Uh, and the other thing that happens is they say, I'm, I'm going to sue you. Mm. or whatever most likely it's something you, you're doing a live hit and you said something about what uh, uh, these guys did that those guys didn't like and those guys didn't like the way you characterize that we're going to sue you for saying that we had evil in our hearts or that we had you know we rushed them or attacked them you know, mm. nobody attacked anybody you know we just ran towards them that wasn't an attack and so um obviously you need a good lawyer and then if, it, if the thing gets really serious, then you get a statement of claim announcing, OK, uh, we've reviewed what you wrote. Uh, this is wrong. That's wrong. Uh, we never said that. Uh, we're going to uh, sue you for defamation uh, for mischaracterizing our organization and our actions that day. And we want to, in one case, this happened to me, we want $36 million. Now, this was back in... Uh, the 70s. Uh, no, no, no. Wait a minute. I'm wrong. No. Oh, this would have been about 2007. I'm sorry. I knew there was a seven in there. And uh, uh, I'll tell you what happened. It won't take very long. Uh, nothing happened. They sued. There was an elaborate statement of claim. Lawyers assembled and uh, put on their best suits, sent out their best bills, and said, okay, well, uh, what, you know, I guess we should try to find a court date. And uh, we never got there, never got to a court date. For seven years, though, mm. uh, a Sikh organization, the World mm. Sikh Organization, kept their lawsuit against me and the CBC alive, somehow, like technically alive, in a drawer somewhere in the courthouse, mm. uh, uh, until uh, 2014, uh, almost 2015, before they quietly decided, okay, the hell with it. You know, like, we don't want to just keep playing the lawyers to shuffle the papers in every year uh, and uh, absolutely nothing came to court after all that sound and fury nothing came to court there wasn't anything there there was no case they, you know their statement of claim just burbled on about nothing in particular and our lawyers just said well you know just let them mm -hmm. flail and eventually they'll go away and he turned out to be dead right nothing happened and since then although there have been uh, other lawsuits uh, it's always the same. They cave, they walk away. The mm -hmm. idea of a lawsuit, people need to remember this when they go in to such mm -hmm. a scenario. The idea of the lawsuit is performative. Mm -hmm. It's not intended to be real. They don't know. They think that if you say something that they don't like, that's defamation. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they don't have the basics of, of the law. They don't understand the basics of the law. They think, well, we're going to sue you for saying that. Well, you know, it, it's not a problem. But what you what needs to be understood is that it's all intended so that they can call a press conference and say, bang the table, we're mm. suing those bastards and we want $36 million or however much it is. Plus punitive damages for the outrageous blah, 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 blah. It's all so they can have that press conference on the news the next day. 
Mm. That's what they want. And once they've got that, they don't care. And if you don't believe me, it keeps on happening. I mean, I, I, I know one case which actually didn't involve me at all, but it did involve, I think, Sikhs for Justice, where they lost the case. Mm. And the lawyer announced the victory. And everyone said, huh, what? Yeah, he did what? Yeah, yeah, I went to the press conference. Yeah, yeah, he announced it was, it was a moral victory because the court heard our case. And there was some procedural ruling that, you know, they were allowed to introduce such and such evidence. This is a very important uh, precedent, uh, mm -hmm. which will be available to all kinds of people in the future. We consider this a resounding victory. And they completely never mentioned the fact that they lost the case. <laughs> So that, that's their idea of a win. So those are uh, ju just a few thoughts uh, that, you know, it's it, it, uh, just because you get a honking great lawsuit uh, after your brilliant story went to air, it don't mean nothing if they sue. Terry, okay. one of the things that, you know, I'd like to ask is that somewhere organizations such as Sick for Justice have mastered the art of understanding the system or using the system to their benefit to silence their critic. Yes, that's that's one way they do it. I mean, there are many newsrooms decimated by loss of funding, loss of staff. I mean, all over the world, this is true, is it not? Hmm. Where, you know, you've only got, you know, one person in there, at all, if they have anyone at all on the weekend and two on a weekday, and, uh, and, the, and they're freelancers, they're not on staff, they have no job security or benefits. And uh, they're easy to scare. I mean, they, you know, they don't have, you know, 40 years of experience uh, to say, well, you know, well, Terry knows that you just ignore this and don't worry about it. They'll, they'll go away. They don't know that. Hmm. And so they're easy to scare. And it is easy to you know, ju just the, the thought of a lawsuit. And hmm. you're sitting there, you know, the corporate masters at whatever hedge fund hmm. now owns your newspaper. Uh, which you, you don't even know because that hedge fund was bought by some other hedge fund. Uh, you're in a very tenuous position. Mm. And, uh, you know, you make a, 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 a wrong decision. Mm. Somebody's going to come after you potentially. Uh, and, mm. you know, how are you going to pay the rent? So you may very well say, okay, well, we'll just spike that story. Mm. Let's, we'll, we'll do an extended weather tonight. Yep. And now more in the weather and sports. Yep. Do you think this is one of the reasons that the so-called 8 July Freedom Day rallies for Khalistan passed away with little or no notice in the mainstream media? That they don't well, want even the Khalistan yeah. movie? The, there was very little notice indeed in the mainstream uh, media, although it's, it's been a, a big story for at least a week now in, in, uh, in India uh, for obvious reasons. I mean, it's their diplomats that could die, you know, and let, let's, let's not fool around. They could. Um, but uh, the um, the media in Canada, uh, and I think to some degree it's true in uh, the UK and in Germany, you'd have to tell me if it's also true to a degree in Australia, uh, is fundamentally not interested in this story. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I learned early on that, you know, I find this story interesting. And uh, I mean, it's influenced, obviously, by the fact that I covered the bombing. I went to uh, Ireland when the plane went down. I met many of the families, became friends with them, know them well to this day. I uh, feel I have an I, It's in my system. I won't, I won't go on. Mm. But um, the issue uh, is not so salient for most people. It was a long time ago. It's a very old story, number one. Number two, it really doesn't reflect very well on Canada. So and it doesn't uh, apply in Australia. But for us, Canadians, the last thing they want to hear is another long, sad story about Air India from Terry Malevsky. <laughs> They're not interested. Face up to it. Uh, deal, deal with it. I don't mind. Mm. Uh, I, I don't mind. Lots of people are interested. They're just not in Canada. So, okay, fine. I, you know, it, I mean, I can still send out a tweet and, you know, 50,000 people see that. Uh, and, uh, you know, okay, well, it's not bad. Um, it's not a network TV audience, but it's still worth it, apparently. Um, but we need to understand that most people aren't following it, don't know what happened, don't know why it happened. 
uh, and there was a poll done in Canada where it did happen about the Air India bombing of 1985, where the vast majority of Canadians couldn't answer a thing about it. They didn't know a thing about it. I mean, I'm not talking about, oh, yeah, they, they knew there was a bombing, but they, they don't know anything about why or who. No, no, I mean that they couldn't answer the most basic, simple questions. You know, uh, uh, and, and uh, that only confirms um, my determination to keep at it, because if I don't, nobody else will. Maybe you guys will. Oh, uh, that's what um, our position here, uh, Terry, is that if we will not do it, nobody will do it. I mean, in Australia, a couple of news outlets did a uh, uh, few stories um, six months back uh, about Khalistan issues. However, uh, the same propaganda thing started in Australia. They started sending hundreds of emails to editor and all this. And uh, my colleague journalist, they told me that it's too ethnic to get into this. We don't want to get into this. So yeah, uh, it's a, yeah, there's a lot of brown people in this story. Let's face it, and uh, uh, and, and, and lots of lots of people are not very interested in that. I mean, let's be blunt. Uh, th this is what you know. This is what's really going on. Uh, and uh, people don't want to move heaven and earth and uh, get out of their easy chairs. Uh, uh, to to dwell on this stuff, particularly when there's a sense of impotence that you know, there's not a whole lot we can do about it. Um, we we might talk about that too, uh, but uh, the, the the fact that people are not interested is uh, an, an occupational. It's it's a, it's simply a fact, but it shouldn't change what you do. I don't think. Yeah. Uh, uh, another thing uh, I want to put is when a Indian Indian side person does something to Khalistan group. Uh, they have their fights and all that. That is uh, uh, disproportionately blown out in Australian or global newspapers or uh, media outlets. However, when Khalistan group does something really bad, like San Francisco thing or coming to Melbourne and uh, trying to cut neck of Gandhi statue, uh, mainstream media yeah. doesn't. Uh, uh, address that. Yes, the, uh, and there's a reason for that. They're doing a better job than we are of getting the story out. What I mean is that, for example, again, I'll, I'll use Canadian example because that's what I know. And uh, you may, I wouldn't be surprised if you've seen some evidence of this in Australia too. They are very good at all, uh, at getting their me their word out to the media. Uh, I mean, the, the, the six in uh, uh, in Canada organized themselves to form a kind of lobby group, mm -hmm. uh, drew up a list of approved representatives of the Sikh community as they saw it, as a separatist organization. That's what the WSO is. Uh, they assembled a list of, you know, we're going to recommend that you call this guy. Here's his number. We just have to, ha we have his email. You know, it's very convenient. It takes work away from you. You know, just call us. We'll be the gatekeeper that ensures that the view you get on the news is approved by us. And they're very good at that. And, and, and to this day, even considering what Canada has been through on this file, the trauma of the Air India bomb, the loss of hundreds of Canadian citizens, even after all of that, uh, Canadians generally, in, in newsrooms, I mean, people in, who are working journalists, they say, well, this is nice. I mean, like, you know, my editor wants me to cover this story. This guy's giving me a whole list of contacts. Great. I'll take it. You know, I mean, it doesn't it usually do, it doesn't occur to them to ask, well, you know, should I cast the net a little wider? But that's the, I believe, is the answer to your question. They're better at this sort of game than we are. Because, you know, the, the average uh Hindu in your story, the average Hindu shopkeeper or whatever, whatever you you want to pick, uh, he he doesn't have a you know a, a clever media savvy lobbying organization at his beck and call that he calls up and says, look, I, I'm I, I've got reporters at my door about this. You know, can you help me out here? I, d I don't want to say anything that's gonna sound the wrong note. Uh, no such thing. You know, you just got to wing it. Uh, where, whereas they're doing a, a quite a professional job. 
that that's that's been my experience, and it ha happens to this day. So that the you know there was a big story recently uh, that was managed, I would say, managed and handled in just the way I've described in uh, big city papers in Canada, uh, which basically um, it didn't ex well not explicitly, but essentially adopted this insane canard that the late Hardeep Nijar in Surrey, British Columbia, was indeed assassinated by the Indian government. You know, the headline on the story was, uh, why do so many people believe that the Indians killed Hardeep Nijar? That was the spin and quite, quite, quite heavy top spin on that story. That's another thing that, you know, you've got to be aware of that, you know, that they want to manage your story. And, and, and when you, when you call up the WSO, the World Seek Organization, or, and you check their website, they're not, they're not, they don't say anything there about their separatist ambitions. They don't say that article two of their constitution is an independent Sikh state called Khalistan. In fact, they're a little bit shocked if you call them a separatist. Well, it doesn't say anything about that on their website. Note, that, that what they say in objection is it doesn't say anything about that on our website. Yeah, they phrase that that way deliberately because what they don't want to say would be a flat out lie that no, no, we, we don't believe in that at all. They do. It's article two of their constitution. So it's uh, for, forewarned is forearmed. Yeah. Uh, Terry, I wanted to ask a question that uh... Uh, all this drama apart, I mean, uh, the governments of, say, Canada or Australia or other governments, I mean, they, they can see the reality in the sense that Australia, India has, uh, you know, 20 million Sikhs. India had a Sikh prime minister for 10 years. Uh, you know, uh, two of India's last 10 uh, chief of uh, the armed forces was a Sikh. So, so it and is the not... Navy and the Air Force. <laughs> Uh, and, yeah. the, and the Supreme Court and on and on. It's amazing. Yes. So, so the thing is that w w what really baffles me is that this idea of, uh, you know, the, the, that some governments in the West not taking stern action because it's not as if we are living in an isolated world. I mean, these politicians can see what is happening in India and find, I mean, demo democracies are chaotic. India is a large country. But then to not take a strong stand i mean say in canada is it like is are the pressures of domestic politics so high uh that because as you mentioned in the beginning of the interview that the idea really is to demonize india uh you know to uh and anything short of that uh these people will cre keep creating this drama so well, they, what, is, what, what is happening really at the government level that why they can't see that this is not just uh, potentially dangerous for india it is also potentially dangerous for countries like canada or australia Oh, no. I mean, the, the snake that we have in our backyard, it's never going to bite us, right? It's, it's going to bite somebody else, but it'll never come and bite me. At least that's what I believe until, it, of course, it does. Um, first thing, um, it doesn't need, you ask, you know, so about the, the pressure on politicians, you know, is it really so high? No, it isn't. But you don't need high pressure to get somebody to bend if they don't have a spine. Hmm. Talking about uh, a... a, a a race uh, of politicians, uh, a generation, a type of politician in the modern age, money-centered campaigning, uh, minority governments hither and yon, tightly polarized electorates uh, who are cowards. Uh, I, th I think it's a fair word to use in this context uh, and uh, know that vote bank politics up until now has generally been working very nicely for them. So uh, it's the annual Vaisakhi parade. You go, you smile, you wave, you hustle for votes, and the parade floats come by with um, uh, martyr posters garlanded in gold and blue tinsel of uh, gun-toting mass murderers, to include the Air India bomber. I mean, they, they, they revere him, they glorify him. Great, now, oh, no, well, no way we're not going to put him on a parade float. And the politicians pretend not to see it. They look. I, I was looking this way. I, I didn't. I didn't see anything. And besides that, you know, I, I have a meeting. I got a rush. <laughs> when you start to ask about it, you know, like, uh, come on, you know, everybody knew. I knew. That's why I'm here to ask you this question. 
And that's why you're running away. Um, so uh, vote bank politics has worked up until now, although people have a, it's easier if you're heading in a campaign to work with somebody who's going to going to bring you a package of 10,000 votes without you having to knock on every door. Uh, you might very well win uh, by going against them if you've got enough people to knock on all, on every other door. Canada, for example, we just, we've just got as many or more Hindus as we have Sikhs. So where are they? And that's the second answer uh, to your question. The great middle of politics in Australia, Germany, UK, Canada, you name it. The great middle of politics, they're chicken. They're uninterested. Face it. Deal with it. They're, they don't they don't want to step up and uh, you know like in this case the Khalistanis are organized fiercely organized they're quite content to resort to uh, intimidation sometimes physical intimidation if they need to be most people are not most people don't operate that way most people don't go to you know take their kids to school with a stick in their hand in case they need to intimidate somebody uh, and the propensity of Khalistanis to uh, default to threats of violence or actual violence is one of the most concerning things that we have to deal with. It works. Muscle works. Uh, we looked, uh, you, maybe you saw the tape. We had a, a truck rally in uh, Toronto mm -hmm. where um, a gentleman that was, uh, a Hindu gentleman who was uh, in a sort of counter rally, I guess you could call it, outside his car and one of the Khalistanis came by a big burly guy runs a security company and is uh, related as it happens to the leader of the new democratic party which currently sustains the minority government of justin mm. trudeau mm. close brackets uh he approached this individual just pushed him down on the street bang back of his head into into the road mm. could have been quite nasty mm. wasn't badly hurt Police said, ah, uh, you know, they just dropped it. They didn't ask the guy if he wanted to drop it. He said he wanted to press charges. And the police said, ah, uh, yeah, yeah, let's just make our lives easy, okay? You know, it's just a normal day. It wasn't that bad. And here, have a cup of tea and go home. Uh, so that, and it's always bubbling very close to the surface, you know, the, the kind of email that I get. You know, you better be careful, Mr. Malevsky. You know, you never know what might happen. Yep. You know, they want, want, me, want me to skip. I mean, that's the default. And here, I, I'll make a prediction. If you go deeper into this, hmm. count for me, count how many times somebody takes a different approach and says, you know, look, I'm, uh, I'm from the WSO, I'm, I'm from the Seeks for Justice, I am, uh, a, you know, a, a peaceful, decent uh, Khalistani, and I, I have no intentions of violence, and I would like to, you know, just take take you for a beer and uh, talk. You know, I'll, I'll give you my views, you give me yours, and we'll talk like rational beings uh, mm -hmm. about the pros and cons of independence. Mm -hmm. Okay, have you ever heard that once so far? Anyone? No. I, I keep asking. <laughs> and I, don't, I, I, I see no hands. No. So you see my point. Yep. That's not what they're about. They are not about facts and evidence and reason. I mean, yep. like all of the cases I've studied of people being beaten by five guys with baseball bats and hockey sticks in a parking lot uh, in Etobicoke, which is a suburb of Toronto, or Ujjal Assange getting beaten by a guy with an iron bar in the parking lot of his law office in Vancouver, mm -hmm. or so on and so on. And so on. you look at every case. Did anyone ever say, hey, you know, you've got to stop saying this or that? Or, or, mm -hmm. or was there any, any appeal to reason ever? No. And people look at you, no, I, no, I, I don't remember that at all. No, 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 that's not what they're about. Yep. Danny, one of the things that, you know, I like to bring you back to it is that the, you said that they're very organized, right? And we, we have now come to the understanding. They understand the system as well. They understand how to exploit the system. In Australia, we are observing that they are, get, they're, get, they're putting a foot into the door of the politicians, police, uh, key uh, justice systems where when asked what's going on here, they say, oh, nothing, this is a peaceful rally. So you're somewhere the media advisors or the multicultural advisors or uh, the uh, 
maybe the broadcaster journalist are sympathetic or enablers of this cause. Uh, is that one of the reasons that in UK, Canada and USA, Canada obviously and UK obviously because you have a large population of you know second, third generation six who may identify with the agendas. Um, yes, yeah, yeah. They are, and, and they're, you know, they're very strategic. Them. They're very yeah. strategic in directing their children to law school, police college, uh, places of influence. Uh, they want to teach things. Uh, uh, they want teachers mm -hmm. to teach things the way they want them taught, mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, they've been very successful. Now we're into the you know third and fourth generations mm -hmm. uh, of, of people coming up. And what are they teaching now? I mean, uh, you know, in many cases they're very modern. They're very tech savvy. Mm -hmm. um, and um, a friend of mine named Dave Hare, whose father was uh, a witness in the Air India trial, or rather he would have been if he had not been murdered before he could testify. Tara Singh Hare was a newspaper editor, mm -hmm. and he knew a great deal about who did and how uh, the Air India bombing. Uh, he told the police, I don't care. They he told his family, I don't care. I'm not going to shut up about this. I'm going to testify. Well, they killed him before the trial. So we never got that testimony. And his son's still around. In fact, he was elected and re-elected uh, as a, a local member of parliament, member of the Legislative Assembly in British Columbia for 11 or 12 years, I believe. And he told me this story because we were talking about this, you know, children coming up, what's their attitude? Mm. He said, well, I, I met uh, just recently, he said, um, young girl, maybe she was 14, 15 years old, no more than that. And she asked me a question. She said, Mr. Hale, why do you refer to the Air India bombers uh, as terrorists? Mm. She said, they're, they're heroes. Heroes. And so he was kind of aghast. Mm. I mean, this is, this is the son of the 332nd victim. And he was aghast. He said, well, well, well what about their families? What about the people they left behind? What about their loved ones? And the girl said, oh, oh, I didn't think of that. Thanks. Well, I don't know how long she's going to think about it, but but she learned that somewhere. Yeah, She learned that somewhere. And if it's not at the Gurdwara, yeah. it's at home. If it's not at home, yeah. it's at the Gurdwara. Somebody yeah. is teaching them. And that's mm -hmm. why they have the big martyr posters up. You know, that, yeah. those things are really important to them. That I, I keep going for everyone rigid by going after that stuff where they're putting up martyr posters of bloodthirsty, mm -hmm. psychopathic mass murderers like Dolvinder Pama, the worst mass murderer in Canadian history. I go that all the time. They don't like that at all when you go after Pama. They mm -hmm. twist and turn and try to explain how he was innocent. The, mm -hmm. the government of India blew up their own airplane and they have these wild cockamamie theories that were debunked years ago. They never seem to make the effort to come up with anything new. They don't expect this to be plausible. It's just noises that they can make to fill the dead air when yeah. you say, no, nah, no, nah, don't give me this BS about the government of yeah. India blowing up the plane. No, one of the things that we saw is that, you know, you are very right that they don't have any facts or rationale to discuss. Um, we saw that I think Jitat was there for almost two hours waiting for the rally to come up. He tried, you know, talking to a few people. They said no English. Uh, we can speak in Punjabi, but in Punjabi, I understood they were giving him the choicest of uh, slangs that they could, uh, uh -huh. but not audible to the camera, right? They're mumbling something, uh, but they were waiting for people to arrive in group, uh, like Hainas, uh, we will attack together. Uh, for 20 minutes or odd 20 minutes, they were there. There were no talking points. There was no explanation what they want, why they want, why was this protest organized? They just you know, the random slogans that they do. And finally, they started speaking, uh, Jitat, uh, you know, Jai Bharadwaj, Murdabad, which is basically death to Jai Bharadwaj, which is kind of a threat. But if you give it in front of uh, 20 odd or 25 odd uh, white Australian policemen with no, almost no Hindi or Punjabi speaking yeah. policemen to advise what's going on, uh, they, they will just ask Jitat to have another cup of coffee and leave or if you need assistance to 
you know, reach your car, we will help you out. But they won't do anything to that. Basically, in Punjabi or Hindi, Hindi they are shouting death to. Yeah, yeah. Like India, well, like you, you've raised an important point. I, I, I'm not familiar with the law in uh, Australia, but I know a little bit about the law in uh, in Canada. And I'm going to have to learn a bit more, I suspect, because this is where this is where we're going next. Is okay. The Indian government uh, is having a fit about the failure of Canada to crack down on people who are threatening the lives and endangering the lives deliberately mm. of named, photographed uh, diplomats in its diplomatic corps. So uh, they're saying to Canada, that's not free speech, that's hate. And Canada's saying, oh, we, we love our freedom of expression, we're not going to abolish that. Well, we all need to take a look at the hate, see exactly what we can do to make those laws as muscular as they need to be and to educate uh, the legal profession and the police officers about what they can make. We need to demonstrate to them by taking cases to court, say, look, uh, you know, I know nobody, nobody's used this section for this because it's talking about um, uh, inciting hatred of a particular group, you know, and it's Jay and he's not a group. So, sorry, Jay, you're on your own. The law isn't going to cover you. But, Absolutely. of course, it, sorry, uh, in this case, in this case, of course, we do, it is a group, as I said before. It's mm. uh, Indian yes. diplomats. So, mm. okay, whew, I'm glad we got that covered. So we, but it's, it's clunky. It's written for about something else. It's written about fermenting racial hatred and that sort of thing. But incitement, uh, mm. it, it's incitement to murder. That, that we're seeing here and there's no two ways about it mm -hmm. uh, i don't know how you can see it as anything else that what why are they on the posters at all if mm -hmm. it's not so that you can recognize them and punish them mm -hmm. well, i mean if it's just some sort of amorphous vague uh, the indian government did it mm -hmm. well what do you have a you know a picture of the lok sub on uh, you know, yeah it's 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 different but when you have specific people here's their name here's their phone number Here's their rank. Go get them. Mm -hmm. And then somebody even uh, somebody is on Twitter trying to defend all of this during a rather heated discussion the other night. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, they said, look, remember that, you know, we've changed the names and the pictures, you know, uh, depending on which country we're in, so that it's not specific to an individual. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, exactly the opposite is true. And they, you know, like we all had fun with this person and awarded them a prize for most idiotic tweet of the night. Uh, because, of course, he or she, or maybe it was, uh, had given the game away. That, that, of course, it's specific to this person. And all you've done is you change it to make it a local poet person that's easier for you to get at. Hmm. Uh, so you can get your guy in Melbourne instead of my guy in Ottawa. Hmm. Um, so yeah, it's. I mean, th this is this is is telling about the insouciance, the ease, the casual ease with which they go out and threaten people, and you know they haven't thought about the legal implications or, or you know, what are they going to say in court if somebody prosecutes them? Well, they don't worry about that because nobody's prosecuting them. So we have to think about we the democracies. All I have to think about this is like mm. the Indians are not wrong mm. that this is a problem. They're wrong that you know we can, that the Canadian Prime Minister can wave a magic wand and lock them all up mm. for crimes of speech and thought. Mm. But if if he can lock them up, or uh, he can't direct the police anyway. But if the police can be educated and prosecutors can be educated to use mm. the hate speech laws properly as they could be used. Then we might be further ahead, I think. Hmm. Uh, Terry, I'll, I'll portray two prime ministers, one of Australia, Anthony Albanese, saying uh, that a Khalistan propaganda uh, will not be tolerated if they go the pathway of violence, if they try to vandal, uh, vandalize the uh, temples or other uh, religious places. He comes up uh, very strongly. The foreign minister, uh, Penny Wong, comes up very strongly that uh, uh, these propaganda referendums have no meaning and we will not uh, let them run amok. 
Now let's go to Canada, where Prime Minister stands in front of media and tells, uh, uh, defends them having that kofalu uh, and uh, 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 where uh, in a parade, uh, Indira Gandhi's assassination was uh, like glorified. He has no word to say that it was wrong and we will punish who has done this. If that sentence was included in whatever he said about freedom of speech, probably India would not have the kind of fit they are having. Hmm. Well, remember that the prime minister would have looked like a bit of a fool if he had said, oh, no, we're going to punish the people who put on that obscene, grotesque celebration of Indira Gandhi's assassination, hmm. only to discover that the prosecutor couldn't make it stick or he didn't say that there was no law. What, what do they do exactly? You know, there, there are sort of there are sort of tailors dummies standing there with guns, and somebody had taken the time to put extra ketchup on uh, Mrs. Gandhi's sari so that you know kids would see plenty of blood. You know, I mean, it was a very sick episode. But how is it illegal? I don't have an answer for you. Hmm. Now, if somebody was going to have an answer on that, hmm. it probably would be me. Uh, I, 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 but but I don't. So I mean, we're going to have to find some lawyers, and I, I, I apologize, I wish I could answer that question, but I don't know how the Prime Minister of Canada could justify mm. saying, oh, don't worry about it, we're going to go after these guys and punish them. Punish them for what? What do they do? I, okay, uh, Terry, let me come in, uh, just a small one. Mm. Would you, uh, tomorrow morning, if there is uh, a glorifying uh, uh, same kind of parade for Osama bin Laden or Al Jaweri or anybody which uh, uh, UK or Canada considers uh, as terrorists is mm -hmm. there. There is no problem with ketchup in their hands and uh, trying to kill us, uh, Canadian soldiers in the battlefield of Afghanistan or Iraq. Will that be all right? I mean, I'm just asking, curious about how the law works. Well, uh, as I say, I don't. I, 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 I guess we're going to find out. Hmm. And, and and the next time we speak, maybe I'll uh, somebody will have tried it. You know, it just needs the Department of Justice and its prosecutors, hmm. or the city and its hmm. prosecutors, to sit down and say, look, you know, to sit down with the Department of Justice and hmm. perhaps with the Foreign Minister, who's been getting a lot of phone calls from India, hmm. some of them quite loud. Mm -hmm. uh, say, okay, well, we, we can't do nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, I put out a tweet yesterday saying, you know, Canada can't do nothing, can it? Or because because if if it can if it doesn't if it do anything, if it does nothing, then that will effectively mean that yes, it's okay in Canada to intimidate and incite hatred of any person you like mm. by name. Show their picture, put them in the maximum possible danger, and say mm. that they're murderers. Mm. I think uh, and rally and, and rally a small army to come and march to your door. You can do all of that perfectly legally in Canada if we don't act. Uh, Terry, um, you know, on behalf of the Australia Today team and our viewers, I would once again like to thank you uh, for your valuable time and also. Uh, your insights into the global Khalistani uh, bonkers uh, propaganda. In fact, you gave us the word of the day, bonkers. On well, I'll give it incompletely, though. I apologize. It should be stark raving bonkers. And in this context, I blew it. I should have used the whole phrase, but I was out of space yeah. on Twitter. <laughs> uh, and I think it's it's the, as, as I, you know, from my academic and research background and as a journalist, I say, if you're not learning, you're not growing either as individual or nation, as society, we cannot go back to the dark uh, days of terrorism where people are afraid to fly back home. Uh, we do not want journalists to be scared of doing their duty. We do not want policemen to be scared to carry out justice. Um, I, I do hope that um, you know, whoever comes next after Trudeau as Canada's prime minister um, and, uh, you know, Anthony Albanese and uh, Rishi Sunak and many other people, uh, especially uh, politicians, will grow a spine and uh, take action. Whoever is the culprit, it doesn't matter whatever their extremist ideology is. Um, as a collective, uh, we should take stand and do our duty. Thank you again. You're, you're right about that. I, I enjoyed this. Thank you, guys.
Thank you. I'm, I'm glad you all came back in one piece. <laughs>